That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many, many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they, cannot, they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, sna the evil one comes and snatches away what, he has, what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown am along the path. And as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, and another sixty, and another thirty. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jess, for reading this passage for us this morning. Well, good morning, ladies. Welcome to week eight of our study in the book of Matthew, a study that has been so fruitful for me, and I pray that it has been for you as well. Before we begin, I'm just going to open us up with a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads together and pray. Father, we come before you and we ask that you please open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts as we prepare to hear your word. We pray that as we hear your word, that you would just convict us and encourage us and edify us this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. He told them many things in parables. This is the title of today's teaching and it couldn't be more spot on. Because our passage today in, in Matthew 13 is all about parables, and honestly, so is the entire chapter. <clears throat> so what's a parable anyways? Well, if you look up a parable, the word in a dictionary, or maybe if you just Google it, like most of us would do, what you'll find is a definition similar to this one. It's a short story that teaches a truth, whether a spiritual truth or a moral truth. Many of us here in this very room will be able to grasp a truth or a lesson more clearly when it's being illustrated for us. And that's exactly what a parable does. And Jesus loved to speak in parables and to teach the crowds many spiritual lessons that they needed to hear. And uh, what we see if we just glance at the Gospels is that they are filled with parables. And uh, Matthew 13 is a perfect example of this. Matthew 13, which introduces Jesus' parables for us in the book of Matthew, is filled with many parables that each teach us something specifically about the nature of the kingdom of heaven. 
If we just glance over to verses 31 to 33, for example, what we'll find is two parables, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven, which each teach us that though the kingdom of heaven would have small beginnings, it wouldn't remain small, but over time, rather, it would experience immense growth. The parable of the sower, which we will be talking about together today, also teaches us something specifically about the nature of the kingdom of heaven. It teaches us what is the true response that brings someone into the kingdom of heaven. But before we talk about this, if you've looked over some of Jesus' parables, you may have wondered, well, why does Jesus speak in parables to begin with? Well, surely there are practical reasons for doing so. Spiritual truths are more concrete, understandable, and interesting when everyday life situations familiar to hearers are being used, whether it's agriculture or, or farming or, or anything else. Well, Jesus actually answers this question for us in this passage, and his answer is pretty surprising. See, Jesus doesn't highlight the practical reasons for speaking in parables, but rather he highlights that parables reveal something to us on a spiritual level. We read here in Matthew 13, starting at verse 10, if you want to follow along. The disciples came and said to Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and I would heal them. So what is Jesus speaking about here? Well, Jesus is actually quoting Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 10 here. And we do well to pay attention to this and to ask ourselves, well, why is Jesus quoting this passage here? In Isaiah 6, Isaiah is commissioned by the Lord to be a prophet for the people of Israel. A prophet being someone called by God to bring God's people who have strayed from him back to himself. But God tells Isaiah that his mission as a prophet won't actually bring the Israelites to repentance. Rather, the Israelites will be hardened further by Isaiah's message, and they will continue in their rebellion against God until God's judgment finally comes upon them. But if you continue to read the, the rest of the book of Isaiah and the rest of the Old Testament, what you'll see is that God did not leave his people without hope, and he promised that redemption would later come. Jesus uses this passage from Isaiah to show that like the Israelites in Isaiah's time who had hard hearts and rejected God, so too many people in Jesus' time would have hard hearts and reject Jesus and his teachings. The parables reveal something to us. They reveal the hearts of individuals, which are either softened hearts or hardened hearts. Those who are hungry to learn and have been given spiritual understanding, well, they're going to grow in their knowledge of God and his kingdom as they seek to grasp the spiritual truths that are found in the parables. We read in Matthew 13, verses 11 to 12, that to them has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And more will be given to them, and they will have an abundance. But for those who have hardened their hearts against Jesus, well, they hear the parables. Yes, they can understand the literal meaning of the parables, but the spiritual truths have been hidden from them because of their rejection. And so they hear the parables, they're hardened further, and so being baffled by them, they, they walk away without spiritual understanding. We read in, in the rest of verse 12 and in verse 13 that for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, and that these people truly do not see, hear, nor understand. 
And Jesus explains this to his disciples. But we shouldn't just see this as an explanation for why Jesus speaks in parables, but also as a warning for us. A warning to not harden our hearts against Jesus. The author of Hebrews in his, in his book, he urges his readers not to harden their hearts as the Israelites did in the wilderness wanderings, and because they did, they would not enter into the promised land. We read, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. So ladies, let, let us also pay careful attention to this warning and not harden our hearts against Jesus and his teachings. Okay, now that we understand why Jesus spoke in parables, let's dig together into a well-known parable of his, the parable of the sower. When Jessica read the passage for us, did you notice that what changes is not the seed, but rather the kind of soil that the seed falls upon? In those times, a farmer would walk up and down the field scattering the seed, but of course the wind could blow some of the seed into neighboring soils, which were not the good soil. As the kind of soils change throughout the parable, we do well to pay attention as this helps us to understand what Jesus is illustrating here. Thankfully, we, we don't really have to go very far to get the explanation of the parable because Jesus himself explains this in this passage. In fact, in, in verse 18, Jesus says, the seed actually represents the word of the kingdom and the, each kind of soil represents a response, a different response to the word. And so what we see as a general spiritual truth in this parable is this. The unchanging word of the kingdom brings about different heart responses. And so let's dig together into these different heart responses. The first kind of soil is the path. And what it describes is a heart that fails to understand and quickly forgets. We read in verse 4 that as the sower sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. And Jesus explains in verse 19 what this means. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This was what was sown along the path. So Jesus here explains the first kind of response to the word of the kingdom, or in other words, the gospel of the kingdom, which Matthew uses in other passages in his book. The people listening to Jesus, they hear Jesus teach the gospel message himself. That they, like every other human being, have failed by God's standards, and they stand as sinners before God in judgment. That they cannot save themselves, but they're in need of salvation and restoration to a right relationship with God because their sin has separated them from him. That this is only possible through putting their, their trust in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and following him and that this would allow them not to be condemned before God. See, Jesus would pay the penalty for their sins and he would die on the cross for their, uh, he would die on the cross for their sins and he would be raised back to life showing that the penalty had been paid in full. And, and for those listening to Jesus, well, Jesus' work at the cross hadn't been finished yet. But, but for us today, well, we know that the work that Jesus came to do is finished. Jesus did die on the cross for our sins, and he, he was raised back to life three days later, showing that anyone who puts their faith in him and trust in him will not stand condemned before God. So the people hearing this, this gospel message that Jesus teaches, well, in this first kind of soil, because of their hard hearts, they, they don't grasp the, the significance of the message. So they quickly forget the message and they, they continue to live life as usual. And the evil one, the devil, rejoices in this. And so in the time of Jesus, <laughs> in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes with their hard hearts well, they would be exemplary of this first kind of soil. But what we see is that this response is not 
just limited to the time of Jesus. Because even today in the 21st century, there are people who respond in this way as well. Maybe it's someone you know in, in your own life who's responded in this way. You shared the good news about Jesus with them and, and they quickly dismissed it. Perhaps because they found it offensive. Or perhaps they don't see themselves as a sinner, but rather as a good person. Or perhaps for them, the idea of someone being raised back to life is just not believable for their skeptical heart. May I encourage you by saying that just because they started in the soil does not mean that they are stuck in the soil. Now, don't take it from me, but look at the example of the life of the Apostle Paul recorded for us in Scripture. After Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul went from a persecutor and killer of Christians, a skeptic of the Christian faith, to one of Jesus' most faithful followers who even became a martyr for his faith in Christ. So, so ladies, I know we all have loved ones who are in the soil, who have dismissed the best news ever that Jesus saves. And, and it hurts us because we care for their souls. We, we want them to be saved. Well, I pray that, that Paul's transformation in his life encourages you as it did me because it, it reminds us that God, by his saving power, can draw even the most unlikely person to himself. No one is too much of a challenge for God and his saving grace and power. So, ladies, keep praying to God. Keep praying to God for your loved ones who are in this soil that God would stir their hearts and would draw them to himself. Because as Paul's life reminds us, well, no one is beyond God's saving grace and power. The second kind of soil is the rocky ground, and what it describes is a heart that fails to persevere. We read in verses 5 and 6, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. And Jesus explains what this means for us in verses 20 to 21. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Like the seed which fell on, on the rocky ground and immediately sprang up, so this person who hears about Jesus immediately receives it with joy. But like the soil was not deep and the, the seed could not be rooted in the soil, that this person who's received Jesus has done so superficially, has not been rooted in Christ. And so the result for the seed that couldn't get the moisture that it needed is that the sun rose and scorched it and it withered away. And the result for the person is that when persecutions or trials come on account of their faith in Christ, well, they don't endure, but they walk away from Christ entirely. So let me ask, what persecutions or trials on account of your faith in Christ do you see in your own life? Did you lose friends because of your faith in Christ? Is there tension between you and, and other family members because you love Jesus? Or maybe, maybe your family has even turned their backs on you because of your love for Jesus. Are colleagues at work giving you a harder time because they know that you're Christian? Or, or have you been accused of being backwards and hateful because you're Christian? No matter what it is, every follower of Jesus will experience persecution in some form or another, though some more than others. Jesus prepares us for this himself. A few weeks ago, Jessica taught on Matthew 10, where Jesus prepares his disciples for the persecution that was coming. So what keeps us from falling away from our faith in Christ in hard times? Well, simply put, it's remembering God's grace. When, we, when we've truly come to believe that salvation can only be found in Christ and following him, well, we remember that these persecutions and trials, though they can often be heart-wrenching, well, they're, they're only temporary, and they can never take away our stance of being 
not condemned, but righteous before God because of Christ. See, when we turn to Christ and we follow him and we listen to him, we are saved, secured, and sustained by him as we continue in his presence in this lifetime and forever in the life to come. Romans 8 reminds us, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So ladies, in times of persecutions and trials, we must hold firmly to this truth and hope. Remember, when we listen to Christ, we turn to him, we are saved, we are secured, and we are sustained by him. And our, our desire now is because we've received this grace that we don't deserve and this, this freedom in Christ, our desire is to share him with those around us who don't know him, no matter the cost. So we must persevere even when persecutions are at their strongest, remembering that Christ will sustain us. In fact, persecutions and trials are what really confirm that our, that our faith in Christ is genuine as we remain steady. And as we read in, in James 1, and I, I pray that this would encourage you this morning, blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. The third kind of soil is the soil among thorns, and what it describes is a heart that is sidetracked by the cares of the world. We read in verse 7, other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And Jesus explains in verse 22 that this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Just like the seeds are choked out by thorns, this person hears about Jesus, but this message is choked out by worldly desires. Rather than putting Christ first and following him, they become distracted by the worldly desires, worldly possessions, worldly things in their lives, and soon enough, their hearts are no longer in love with Jesus and, and following him, but rather they're in love with the world. There's a real danger here that we need to pay attention to. Because we can start strong in our faith in Christ, but if we're not careful, we can get wrapped up in the world. So what are the worldly desires in your life that are tempting that, if you're not careful, can take Jesus' place in your heart? Is it money or possessions? Is it the approval of others? Is it the love of entertainment? Maybe you've been tempted before to say, well, you know, one more episode or just 15 minutes of scrolling on social media. When you knew that this would dig into your time that you set aside to be with the Lord in prayer and in his word. Is it having the best career? Have you become so focused on work or school that, that it's become your identity? An identity that will leave you with a void that cannot be filled. Or have you begun to place your identity in the success of your children and, and how their success makes you look? Or maybe, just, just maybe, romantic relationships are what cause you to stumble. Maybe you've been tempted to believe that, that only when you're in a romantic relationship and when you've found a husband, then you can finally be happy. Maybe you struggle in your singleness, seeing all your friends around you, settling down, getting married, having kids. It, it can be extremely painful. Whatever it is, there's, there's always something in our lives. And, and we need to pay attention to the warning here. Because it's so easy for these worldly desires to overwhelm us if we're not careful and to become our treasure and our identity. And I speak from personal experience because in the past I did make school and the validation of others my identity. I forgot that my identity is in Christ and in being a child of God and that only this would give me true satisfying purpose. 
John in his first epistle, he reminds his Christian readers that you cannot love both the world and the Father. And Jesus, in fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, earlier in Matthew, reminds us that we cannot serve two masters because we will either love the one and be devoted to the one and we will hate and despise the other. The greatest treasure is not found in any of these worldly desires. Our culture may want us to believe that it is, but it's not. The greatest treasure is rather following Christ and, and knowing him, which leads us to our fourth and final kind of soil. The good soil is the fourth and final kind of soil, and what it describes is a heart that understands, perseveres, and bears much fruit. We read in, in verse 8, other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And Jesus explains in verse 23 that this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So what makes someone good soil? Well, someone who is good soil hears about Jesus trusts in him not only as savior but also as lord and makes jesus his treasure rather than anything or anyone else in in this world they they see the incomparable value of the kingdom of heaven and they're ready to give up all that they have for it they're ready to give up their desire to rule their life apart from god that they're ready to give up the sins that once took them captive and they're ready and working daily on preventing worldly desires from coming in and choking out their love for Jesus. Like the man who sold all that he had for the hidden treasure that he found in a field, which we see actually in Matthew 13 in one of the parables, and uh, like the merchant in search of fine pearls, sold all that he had to buy that one pearl of great value Well, this person in the good soil, they're ready to sacrifice it all for the kingdom of heaven, which is of incomparable value. Someone in good soil trusts in Jesus and and perseveres until the end and shows evidence of fruit in their lives, showing sacrificial love for God and for all neighbors, even the difficult ones, because all have been created in God's image having a character of humility, patience, gentleness, serving the Lord in the different areas in which they've been called or gifted, whether it's teaching the word, whether it's serving in different ministries in the church, whether it's serving in hospitality in their neighborhoods, or or any other kind of service to the Lord. And truthfully, some will produce more fruit than others, because we see this in verse 23. Jesus says, he indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Now our desire should be to to want to produce much fruit for Christ. But what we need to remember is that the amount of fruit that we have in our lives does not change our stance of being not condemned before God. So long as there is evidence of genuine fruit in our lives when we trust in Christ. Someone in the good soil, anyone in the good soil, with this kind of response, belongs to Jesus' kingdom, to the kingdom of heaven. And and I want to make this very, very clear, that this, this life transformation and this producing of fruit for Christ, well, it's not something that you can do in your own abilities alone. No, no, every follower of Christ has the Holy Spirit indwelling within them who empowers and transforms us and helps us to produce fruit in our lives. So we must depend on the Holy Spirit, but we must not also be passive in this matter. You need to be actively wanting to produce fruit, wanting to serve the Lord. There, there's got to be a work. We work with the Holy Spirit within us. So if you've trusted in Jesus... Do you see the evidence of fruit in your own life? Where is the fruit in your life? Often, the people that are closest to us, the the faithful Christians that are closest to us, well, they may be able to see the fruit more clearly than us, so, so why not ask them? 
Okay, now that we have discussed these different heart responses, what we need to remember is that only one response, only this response, the good soil, is what shows us that we truly belong to Jesus. Our response to the gospel message matters. Your response matters, and, and so does mine. We need to check the condition of our hearts regularly. So right now, let's, let's do a little reflection. Of the different kind of soils that we've discussed, right now in this moment, which soil are you really? Can you confidently say that you believe that Jesus died for your sins and, and rose back to life so that you could be in a right relationship with the one and only true God? Do you, do you believe that this is the greatest treasure and out of your desire and out of your gratitude for him, your desire is to produce much fruit, to, to, to follow him, no matter the cost? Are you the good soil? Or do you find yourself in the path? Has someone talked to you about, about Jesus and what he's done for you? And did you dismiss the best news ever? Well, if this is you this morning, please hear this message now. Don't forget it. Hear it and respond. Or are you the rocky ground? Did you trust in Jesus, but then when you lost friends or the approval of your, of your loved ones, did you decide, well, it's just easier to walk away from Jesus entirely? Ladies, please don't let persecutions or trials, no matter how difficult they may be, separate you from the crown of eternal life that will be yours if you endure. Persevere in Christ, the one who can sustain you in all circumstances of life. Or do you find yourself in the soil among thorns? Did you hear about Jesus but then other worldly desires, things in the world that you treasured in your life, well, they came in and they choked out your love for Jesus. If this is you, it's not too late to turn back and to make him your treasure again. Jesus warns us in this parable, don't dismiss the gospel message. Don't let persecutions lead you to fall away from Christ. And don't let the love of the world choke out your love for Jesus. Rather, pay close attention to the gospel message. Stand firm in Christ amidst persecutions and be on the lookout for all worldly desires that can come and choke out your love for Jesus. Put to death the idea that any of these worldly desires can give you true satisfying purpose and put your treasure in the one who can. Treasure Jesus. If you are in Christ, his spirit is within you and empowers you to do these things that you're unable to do on your own. And ladies, if you have put your trust in Jesus and you are following him today, the greatest sower and our example, Jesus, calls you and I to be sowers of the gospel message. Just like Jesus sowed the word of God to the people in his time and the disciples did the same. They were instructed to do the same, and they did so in the early church. Well, today, in the 21st century, we are called to do the same. So share the very gospel message that transformed you and gave you new life with confidence that God will make the harvest happen. It may seem so discouraging to us. We, we see that out of all of the responses, only one is the true response that brings someone into the kingdom of heaven. Not all seed falls on the good soil, but some will. And so the sower and the farmer, knowing this, continues to sow. Not all people who hear about Jesus will respond genuinely and with a true heart response, but, but some will. Jesus, when he was explaining in Mark's gospel, when he explained to his disciples that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God, the disciples were absolutely astonished. And they exclaimed, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus' response was, was clear and full of hope. Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. 
See, only God knows the condition of one's heart. And God is able to change hearts. Remember this. Like we've already said, no one is beyond God's saving power and grace. Maybe you know someone in your life who you think, Oh, they're, they're too wrapped up in culture. They're too wrapped up in the world. Well, they'll never turn to Christ. Or, or maybe you know someone who walked away from Jesus because of hardship. Or maybe you know someone who just rejected the message and Jesus. Maybe they said something like this. I'm a person of science, not of religion. No matter who it is, we are not to stop praying for them and witnessing to them about Jesus when we have opportunity, because as mentioned before, just because they are in this soil does not mean that they are stuck in the soil. Our mission is to faithfully and lovingly continue to sow the gospel message in the world around us. God is at work, and he will make the harvest happen. So as we close, knowing this, Trusting this, continue to sow the good news about Jesus, the one truth that saves souls, and leave the hardest work, the changing and turning of hearts, up to God alone.